I'm going to try to moderate this um, and keep people to the time to leave enough uh, um, space for questions afterwards. So um, we are going to begin with Adrian, um, and then we'll have a, a time for questions and a brief break before turning it over to Etienne Bonivar. Thank you. Harvard University's Marxist biologists, Richards Levins and Lewontin, dedicate their 1985 book, The Dialectical Biologist, quote, to Friedrich Engels, who got it wrong a lot of the time, but who got it right where it counted, end quote. In the English, French, and German-speaking worlds of the Western Marxisms of the mid-20th century up through the present, the viewpoint expressed in this dedication is an unfashionable rarity. The Engels acknowledged by Levins and Lewontin is the object of either total neglect or brusque dismissals within such still influential movements as the Frankfurt School and Althusserianism. However, in their refusal to treat this Engels as the deadest dead dog of them all, these two leftist scientists implicitly urge a rescue operation in the contemporary conjuncture resembling the one Marx claims to perform vis-a-vis -vis Hegel. That is to say, the gesture called for here is one of saving the quote-unquote rational kernel located at the heart of the Engelsian dialectics of nature. In his early gem of a book, 1975's Theory of Contradiction, Alain Badiou takes Engels to task for overemphasizing unity at the cost of correspondingly underemphasizing disunity as antagonism, conflict, etc. Basing himself largely on Mao's 1937 essay on contradiction, the young Badiou seeks not to restore balance to dialectical materialism, but to tilt the unevenness in the opposite direction by asserting the primacy of disunity over unity. In the same 1975 book, he also insists that it is necessary to dialecticize the dialectic itself. In other words, the dialectic must be made to become self-reflexive. He reaffirms this important thesis on several subsequent occasions, a thesis I will rely upon later in this intervention. Not only does Badiou have Maoist reservations about Engels' version of dialectical materialism, he also would be allergic to the sorts of alliances with the empirical experimental sciences of nature esteemed by Engels himself. But curiously, two proponents of an Engelsian-style rapprochement between Marxist materialism and the sciences, Sebastiano Tempinaro and Lucien Sev, likewise speak positively of dialecticizing the dialectic. Before segueing into an engagement with Engels, a few more features of Badiou's philosophy warrant comment here. Despite his pronounced post-Althusserian penchant for mathematical formalization and his correlatively restrictive conception of scientificity, Badiou, in a recent set of interviews, says a number of interesting things. First and foremost, he declares therein that, quote, as regards what has to do with thought, I am a partisan of the doctrine of emergences. Life is a universe irreducible to matter, and thought is a universe irreducible to life. Thought is, in every case, a sui generis activity, end quote. This very much appears to be an endorsement of emergentism as a theoretical set of models in the natural sciences generally and the life sciences especially, models stressing irreducibility and complexity at different material levels. Given Badiou's repeated Coiré-inspired refusals to concede a scientific status to biology over and above molecular chemistry, this new reference, not to be found in his prior work, is somewhat surprising. However, recourse to emergentism is consistent not only with his youthful embrace of the materialism of the Marxist tradition, as incarnated in Maoism in particular, the quote-unquote materialist dialectic of his 2006 masterpiece, Logics of Worlds, readily could be interpreted in this context as involving a non-biological version of the notion of strong emergence qua the imminent genesis of the thereafter transcendent. But Badiou's affirmation of emergentism betrays, to reach for a Hegelian adjective, a one-sided conception of this doctrine on his part. Theories of emergence are spontaneously speculative in Hegel's precise sense insofar as they strive to think the dialectics of continuity and discontinuity. 
Badiou, with his insistence upon the sui generis irreducibility, that is, life is irreducible to matter and thought is irreducible to life, with his insistence on this, he lopsidedly highlights only the discontinuous side of the idea of emergence. As for the flip side of continuity and intention with his recent appeal to emergentism, his philosophy alternates between omitting or forbidding natural scientific accounts of how matter generates out of itself autonomous strata of more than material entities and events. Minus such accounts, recourse to emergentism is in jeopardy of being merely a fig leaf covering disavowed non-materialist dualisms. Whatever the limitations of Badiou's thought as regards the relations between science and materialism, I wish in passing to touch upon two other facets of his philosophy relevant to my present pursuits, facets with which I agree, and these in addition to his 1975 criticism of Engels to be redeployed in my readings of the latter below. First, in the already mentioned interviews, Badiou rightly points out that materialism does not automatically entail determinism. It does so only under the assumption of the validity of an underlying mechanistic, reductive, and or eliminative metaphysics. I concur with Badiou as regards this, although as will become increasingly evident in what follows, he and I differ in terms of the formulation of a non-deterministic materialism. The second facet of Badiou's philosophy, which I enthusiastically embrace in this context, is his now famous distinction between the materialist dialectic and quote unquote democratic materialism as articulated in the preface to Logics of Worlds, with democratic materialism admitting the existence of brute physical bodies and culturally relative languages and nothing more. This distinction elegantly captures some fundamental features of the historical situation of late capitalist societies at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st centuries. In connection with my efforts to wed today's life sciences to Marxist materialism, I see current ideological scientisms parasitizing off biology and its branches. These phenomena include, among other things, development subsumable under the heading of biopolitics, intellectually bankrupt sociobiology and its myriad academic offshoots, media popularized genetic determinisms, and pharmaceutical in industry disinformation. I see current scientisms as engaged in the activity of painting a capital complicit portrait of quote unquote human nature that can and should be combated mercilessly, not only by philosophy and political theorizing, but by these modes of thought as armed specifically with life scientific insights contesting such scientific caricatures and idols. Of course, Badiou doesn't ally his materialist dialectic with biology so as to delegitimize democratic materialism according to its own ostensibly but fraudulently scientific standards. This would be to employ a Trojan horse tactic of imminent critique. However, although I differ tactically from Badiou, my tactics are guided in part by his perceptive diagnosis of the prevailing ideological zeitgeist as democratically materialist. To be more precise, the scientistic renditions of human nature, I believe a post engelsian materialism to be the best bet against, arguably are permutations of democratic materialism, a subvariant of it I might label capitalist biologism, for which there are only efficient causal exchanges between wholly freestanding inner essences and external existences. <coughs> this ideology has a long history, clearly flowing from, among other points of origin, Hobbes, Smith, and company. Contemporary capitalist biologism, as I conceive it, makes unsubstantiated appeals to the life sciences so as to depict human beings as non-dialectical juxtapositions of, on the one hand, quote unquote, nature as a necessary bundle of innate urges, the bodies of Badiouian democratic materialism viewed as gene machines programmed by evolutionary pressures, and on the other hand, quote unquote, nurture as contingent clusters of fungible objects, the languages of democratic materialism, this time as shifting bundles of commodities and commodified relationships. In an unsatisfying ideological fudge of the distinction between freedom and determinism, people are seen as propelled by an irresistible genetic destiny into proliferating networks of socially constructed choices between competing goods and services. For the capitalist biologist, the life of humanity is reduced to an ongoing negotiation between the lone two independent parties of fixed instincts and fluid providers of their satisfactions. There are only these economies contracts, and transactions, what Jacques Lacan labels, quote unquote, the service of goods. 
The sciences are supposed to substantiate this bleak and boring picture, and either to medicate or to kill those who cannot or will not make peace with it. To transition from Badiou back to Engels, although I agree with Badiou's criticism of Engels' inordinate privileging of motifs of unity, I consider it to be both possible and productive to rework the Engelsian dialectics of nature from within. That is to say, whereas Badiou's critique of it is external, mine is imminent. I want now to focus on Engels' 1876 essay entitled The Part Played by Labor in the Transition from Ape to Man, itself arguably the most interesting and significant chapter of Dialectics of Nature. This piece, I would maintain, is the closest Engels comes to supplying Marx's historical materialism with its required dialectical but naturalistic account, consistent with Darwinism, of human beings as laboring social creatures. Its opening paragraph states, quote, labor is the source of all wealth, the economists assert. It is this, next to nature, which supplies it with the material that it converts into wealth. But it is also infinitely more than this. It is the primary basic condition for all human existence, and this to such an extent that, in a sense, we have to say that labor created man himself, end quote. In fact, labor, given the Marxist conception of humanity's Gattungswesen, that is species being, labor initially is itself no more than an inner facet of the natural world. Human species being, as one variety of animal life among many others, physically dictates that humans, like all other animals, struggle with their natural material surroundings in order to sustain themselves as living beings. This is an instance of nature as a not whole non one, shot through with internal antagonism to antagonisms and tensions, wrestling with itself. And this, in that the human beings who wrestle with nature are themselves imminent to nature, or parts of it. A further speculative twist to be appreciated in the preceding quotation is the reversal Engels brings about between agent and action. Intuitive notions of agency, here the laboring subject, and activity, here this subject's labor, usually portray agency as enjoying ontological priority over activity. In this non-dialectical ordering of precedence, the relation of influence is a one-way street, with an already there agent, again the laboring subject, determining and producing a corresponding action, again the subject's labor. From this perspective, actions do not correlatively but inversely determine and produce agents. By sharp contrast, for both Marx and Engels, reciprocal interactions between subjects and objects, mediated by practices qua actions mutually modifying both these poles in parallel, these are the rule. Thus, in the perpetually ongoing activity of laboring, humans continually change themselves at the same time as they alter their others, that is, the enveloping environs of natural entities and forces. Hence, labor creates its subject as much as its subject creates it. In other words, the human being is, by nature as per the species being, the simultaneous subject object of labor. Drawing on the fresh stores of ammunition from Darwinian biology available to him, Engels alights upon the human hand with its opposable thumb as a naturally evolved physical feature of human anatomy of immense import. He situates this body part at the nexus of the dialectical interactions through which natural history imminently sunders itself by giving rise to human subject objects of labor who themselves, through their nature prompted actions, catalyze the explosive emergence of denaturalized social history. At one point, Engels asserts, quote, the hand is not only the organ of labor, it is also the product of labor, end quote. Darwinian evolution's precise modes of historicizing nature themselves permit plugging into the apparatus of Marxist materialism what could be called bioplasticity, along the line so crucial to Kathleen Malibu in her own substantial efforts to invent a new dialectical materialism for the 21st century. This bioplasticity is a pivotal component of a specifically materialist dialectics of human beings as self-transformative subject objects. Adding speech to labor, albeit without an accompanying story about the evolution of language, Engels proceeds to describe a complex ensemble of entangled, interpenetrating factors responsible for the ascent out of natural matter 
of the more than natural structures and phenomena of concern to Marx's historical materialism. With the hypothesis in the background that the human brain's evolution was driven forward by hand-directed labor, he elaborates, quote, the reaction on labor and speech of the development of the brain and its attendant senses, of the increasing clarity of consciousness, power of abstraction and of judgment, gave an ever-renewed impulse to the further development of both labor and speech. This further development did not reach its conclusion when man finally became distinct from the monkey, but on the whole, continued to make powerful progress, varying in degree and direction among different peoples and at different times, and here and there even interrupted by a local or temporary regression. This further development has been strongly urged forward on the one hand and has been guided along more definite directions on the other hand, owing to a new element which came into play with the appearance of fully fledged man, namely society." End quote. Engels goes on to contend that these evolutionarily sparked revolutions understandably prompt the advent of idealist worldviews throughout humanity. Quote, by the cooperation of hands, organs of speech, and brain, not only in each individual, but also in society, human beings became capable of executing more and more complicated operations and of setting themselves and achieving higher and higher aims. With each generation, labor itself became different, more perfect, more diversified. Agriculture was added to hunting and cattle breeding, then spinning, weaving, metalworking, pottery, and navigation. Along with trade and industry, there appeared finally art and science. From tribes, there developed nations and states. Law and politics arose, and with them, the fantastic reflection of human things in the human mind, religion. In the face of all these creations, which appeared in the first place to be products of the mind, and which seemed to dominate human society, the more modest productions of the working hand retreated into the background, the more so since the mind that plans the labor process already at a very early stage of development of society was able to have the labor that had been planned carried out by other hands than its own. All merit for the swift advance of civilization was ascribed to the mind, to the development and activity of the brain. Men became accustomed to explain their actions from their thoughts instead of from their needs, which in any case are reflected and come to consciousness in the mind. And so there arose in the course of time that idealistic outlook on the world which, especially since the decline of the ancient world, has dominated men's minds." End quote. The very material history of the factual natural genesis of denaturalized humanity ironically sets the stage for its own occlusion by preparing the triumph of anti-materialist fictions, of, of fictions as religion, spiritualisms, and so on. It's high time for a sip of water. In the elongated movement from natural to human history via literally manual labor, labor engaged in by social beings, that is humans a la Marx with their peculiar Gattungswesen qua self-denaturalizing nature as working gregarious animals, this labor triggers a cascade of ever more intricate divisions of labor in which a split between manual and intellectual labor eventually opens up in societies. In short, manual labor produces out of itself the divide between itself and intellectual labor. What's more, this thus produced intellectual labor erases the memory of its material historical origins and in so doing propagates ideologies that come to color the consciousness of intellectual and manual laborers alike for countless generations thereafter. Philosophers and non-philosophers both end up vulnerable to the seductions and temptations of idealism to misconstruing themselves and their societies as marching on their heads. What about Engels' legacy, transmitted via the British Marxist and Soviet scientists and philosophers of science of the decades of the 20th century prior to the Second World War? What about Engels' legacy as it stands nowadays in the life sciences? In the book they dedicate to Engels, Levins and Lewontin endorse the Engelsian dialectics of nature generally and the sorts of speculations spelled out in the part played by labor in the transition from ape to man specifically. They embrace Engel's insistence that human and non-human animals alike are organisms participating in a subject-object dialectic with their environments. Levinson and Lewontin, and Stephen Rose too, repeatedly emphasize both first, that organisms and environments aren't truly separable from each other, and second, that organisms aren't just passively determined by their environments, 
but act to determine their environments in turn. These two biologists concur with Engels that, quote, human society arises out of animal social organization, but as it arises, it transforms the significance of adaptations and creates new needs, end quote. Consciously following in Engels' footsteps, they seek to cultivate a balanced appreciation of the mixed continuities and discontinuities between humans and the rest of animal nature. With this balance by their Engelsian lights, once again compelling recourse to a dialectical materialism, steering between the Scylla and Charybdis of, on the one hand, mechanistic and reductive materialism, and, on the other hand, all sorts of idealisms. And whereas Engels places the human hand at the intersection between crisscrossing subjective and objective processes, Levens and Lewontin, for the same basic reasons, foreground the plastic cerebral cortex as the embodiment epitomizing human status as hybrid subject objects. However, although it's Levens and Lewontin who dedicate a book to Engels, Rose is more faithful to orthodox Engelsian dialectical materialism insofar as this doctrine favors images of ultimate wholeness when all is said and done. To be more exact, Rose's book Lifelines, Biology Beyond Determinism appears to be philosophically inconsistent in its wavering between embracing strong emergentist models with their anti-reductive and anti-determinist upshots and unnuanced affirmations of the monistic oneness and self-consistency of material being as an ontologically seamless totality. He repeatedly qualifies his commitment to explanatory diversity, for instance, the irreducibility of biological to physical explanations. He qualifies this as strictly epistemological, with this epistemology of irreducible plurality being coupled with an ontology of unity. Rose declares, quote, our world may be, as I would claim, an ontological unity, but to understand it, we need the epistemological diversity that the different levels of explanation offer, end quote. He later reiterates, quote, we live in a material world which is an ontological unity, but which we approach with epistemological diversity, end quote. And yet, given other of Rose's assertions, it seems he needs the irreducibility of emergent phenomena to be a matter of real being and not just scientific thinking, to be ontological in addition to epistemological. That is to say, his world has to be really diverse instead of unified, namely, a detotalized not whole rather than an organic one all. Indulging in the problematic equivocation between freedom and mere indeterminacy, he speculates that nature, especially at its organic levels, is so complex and overdetermined that, in and of itself, in its self standing objective existence, it defies all determinist hypotheses put forward by reductionist biologists. Underscoring his, ontologiz his ontologizing of what he elsewhere inconsistently treats as strictly epistemological, he states, quote, indeterminacy is not merely a matter of ignorance or lack of adequate technology. It is inherent in the nature of life itself, end quote. A further source of tension with Rose's prevailing and Gelsian holism is generated by his astute diagnoses of images of nature with a capital N, these images of what supposedly would be balanced and harmonious on its own were it not for humans are precious to environmentalists and nowadays an accompanying horde of advertisers and their consumers. Rose diagnoses these as ideological illusions with no basis in the life sciences. Rose doesn't clarify how and why his periodically proclaimed faith that the natural world ultimately is a smooth monistic unity isn't symptomatic of a lingering, undiagnosed attachment on his part to exactly the same rudimentary vision of nature held to by eco-ideologues. But instead of chastising Rose for a lack of theoretical rigor, I intend to trace his vacillations back to tensions already internal to Engels' materialist dialectics of nature and to put these tensions to work. The second chapter of Dialectics of Nature entitled Dialectics, opens with the Engels of notoriety much criticized by anti-Engelsian Western Marxists for promoting an arid a priori Hegelian formalism of a pre-Marxist kind fancifully projected onto a nature beyond history. 
Admittedly, there is something to these criticisms apropos charges regarding the instrumental methodical formalization of Hegel's philosophy in this context. However, what these same criticisms overlook is the possibility to be explored here of an imminent instead of an external critique of Engelsian dialectics. The first sentence fragment of Engels' chapter devoted to dialectics, he opens it with a parenthetical, reads, quote, the general nature of dialectics to be developed as the science of interconnections in contrast to metaphysics, end quote. Obviously, Engels one-sidedly subsumes his post hegelian conceptual toolkit under the heading of unity by defining dialectics as, quote unquote, the science of interconnections. He then infamously lists his three dialectical laws. One, the law of the transformation of quantity into quality and vice versa. Two, the law of the interpenetration of opposites. Three, the law of the negation of the negation. What Engels apparently fails to realize under the influence of his lopsided organicist monism is that the first of his three laws of dialectics in particular is double-edged, with one of its edges directly cutting against his holistic overemphasis on unity, integration, connectedness, and so on. Hegel's dialectics of quantity and quality, adopted as a principle or rule by Engels, is the original conceptualization of the structures and dynamics integral to the much more recent life scientific paradigm of emergentism, as operative in the writings of Levins, Lewontin, and Rose, among many others. In light of Hegelian speculative reasons handling of continuity and discontinuity, the discontinuities catalyzed by and operative within the interactions between quantitative and qualitative dimensions must be granted their place as well. I interpret some of Levin's and Lewontin's ideas as moving more in this direction. In 2006, Badiou has acknowledged, observes that the traditional conflict between idealism and materialism has been superseded under late capitalism by a new intramaterialist antagonism between democratic materialism and the materialist dialectic. Already in the 1970s, Levins and Lewontin similarly observe that, within and around the sciences, idealism versus materialism has been replaced by reductionism versus dialectics. But unlike Rose, they unambiguously and unwaveringly adhere to an ontologized strong emergentist schema in which dialectical processes resembling those of Hegelian quantity and quality give rise to relatively autonomous levels and layers of embodied being irreducible to the other material strata from which they arose. For my purposes, certain of Levin's and Lewontin's specifications of their anti-reductivist dialectics of nature are of special significance. First of all, in both The Dialectical Biologist and Biology Under the Influence, their two co-authored collections of essays, they repeatedly speak of quote-unquote weak constraints as regards the concrete localizations of living organisms within intricate intersections of multiple regions of relations, entities, and forces. On one of these occasions, they explain, quote, biological objects are intermediate in size and internally functionally heterogeneous. As a consequence, their behavior cannot be determined from a knowledge of only a small number of properties, as one can specify the orbit of a planet from the planet's distance from the sun, its mass, and its velocity, without being concerned about what it is made of. Biological objects are at the nexus of a very large number of individually weak forces. Although there are indeed interactions among these forces, and the interactions are often of the essence, it is also the case that there are a very large number of subsystems of causal pathways that are essentially independent of one another so that their effects on an organism appear as random with respect to one another." End quote. The counterbalance against the Engelsian privileging of interconnectedness is obvious here. But I perceive a further step that should be taken at this point. I can introduce this additional move thusly with the United States Federal Tax Code as an example of a symbolic system. This code is a body of technical legal stipulations so massive that no single person, not even the most knowledgeable tax expert, has a complete understanding of the entire network of laws and how these laws fit together with one another. Moreover, year after year, successive legislative sessions of Congress change the code, 
adding, subtracting, and modifying laws. Of course, this means that the creation of ever more loopholes in the tax code is a foregone conclusion, since those altering this body of laws cannot know in advance what unforeseen possibilities will arise from the structural interactions between the already less than fully understood prior set of existing laws and the changes as additions, subtractions, and modifications made to these laws. Firms dealing with accounting and tax advice make their money by discovering and exploiting the loopholes in the body of laws forming the entirety of the US federal tax code. This example of tax law as a symbolic system arguably holds, at least by analogy, for quote, the nexus of a very large number of individually weak forces, end quote, within which Levins and Lewontin situate biological beings. That is, it holds for real as well as symbolic systems for natural as well as non-natural structures and dynamics. If plausibly, the weakness of the multiple influences and causes which Levins and Lewontin describe functions as per my illustration of symbolic systems surpassing a certain threshold of complexity. Then, however rarely, the weak shackles of these forces sometimes come undone and fall to the ground thanks to their own disharmonious, contradictory clashes with, with each other, their inner incompatibilities. Weak overdetermination, a la Levins and Lewontin, leads out of itself to under or non determination. And this, however occasional and exceptional might be, these loophole like short circuits imminently transpiring within natural materialities, these zones of enemy opened by a self sundering substance as necessary but not sufficient conditions of possibility for the autonomy of denaturalized more than materialities such as the subjective agents of socio-historical change not forever doomed to alienated servitude to whatever counts as the purportedly quote-unquote natural status quo. This is an important step along the road from dialectical to transcendental materialism, a transition entailing the sublation of the former by the latter. Marx's historical materialism, with its presuppositions apropos human species being, this Gattungswesen includes an effective, non-epiphenomenal conscious volition belonging to minded and like-minded human beings, in addition and related to their need-driven social laboring. Marx's historical materialism requires this transcendental materialist supplement. Although transcendental materialism is deeply indebted to Engels' dialectical materialism, Engels doesn't quite manage, in his admirable efforts toward this goal, to outfit Marxism with a systematic quasi-naturalist materialism dovetailing with and firmly buttressing Marx's historical materialist critique of political economy. Even more significantly, Levins and Lewontin stipulate an implicit modification to Engels' third law of dialectics, that is, the law of the negation of the negation. Whereas Engels harnesses the Hegelian concept of determinate negation in the service of a picture of the material real as a tightly woven tapestry of exhaustively entwined threads, his two biologist descendants put forward a notion of determinate negation, introducing discontinuities rather than establishing and sustaining continuities. They contend, quote, nothing is more central to a dialectical understanding of nature than the realization that the conditions necessary for the coming into being of some state of the world may be destroyed by the very state of nature to which they gave rise, end quote. More so than Engels' formalization of dialectics as an instrumental method, Levin's and Lewontin's characterization of the dialectics of nature clearly involves generalizing specifically from Marx's Hegel-inspired dialectical analyses of socio-historical development hitherto as propelled forward by the negative energy of class struggles, culminating, of course, in communism destroying capitalism after capitalism makes possible and gives rise to communism. For Marx, quote, human anatomy contains a key to the anatomy of the ape, end quote. Likewise, for Levins and Lewontin, historical dialectics contain a key to the logics of natural dialectics. This newer post-Engelsian dialectics of nature tacitly relies upon a metadialectical meta dialecticization of dialectics, it's a bit of a tongue twister, along the lines of what Badiou, Timpanaro, and Saval demand. More precisely, in addition to the indeterminate negations of the understanding, Verstand, and the determinate negations of reason, Vernunft, 
with the second as interpreted by Engels. Levins and Lewontin hint at a third type of negation, itself a permutation of Hegelian determinate negation qua dialectical. This third variety I might depict as the non-dialectical side of determinate negation, with this depiction entailing a meta-dialectics of the dialectical and the non-dialectical internal to determinate negation. Apart from whatever inherent philosophical interest it might possess, what if any payoff does my transcendental materialist Alfred Bung of dialectical materialism yield relative to the guiding, overriding concerns of the Marxist tradition as a distinct political and theoretical orientation or set of orientations? Broadly and summarily speaking, I see four primary fashions in which this approach is constructive and useful for Marxism in particular. One, my repetition of a gesture first boldly performed by Engels and Lenin, that is, recruiting the natural sciences to the side of Marxist materialism, this gesture turns the life sciences themselves in a preeminent cultural and institutional position in the current Western world from supporting to contesting the Hobbesian Smithian portrait of human nature, and along with this, lending further support to Marx and Engels' load-bearing materialist hypotheses regarding the species being of humanity. Two, transcendental materialism's metadialectics of nature helps to debunk, both philosophically and scientifically, contemporary scientistic ideologies, such as those related to what Rose labels quote-unquote neurogenetic determinism, falsely naturalizing status quo social relations and forms of subjection as ideology in various socio-historical guises typically tries to do. On the active front of a live intellectual war of position, this updated materialism strives to unmask bioscientism's specious rationalizations for a mind-boggling array of infrastructural and superstructural features of late capitalism. Three, it pursues what I see as the valuable goal of thoroughly immunizing Marxist materialism from the threats of three intellectual and ideological dangers. First, covert idealisms, a la post-Lukacian antipathy to the natural sciences and Western Marxism. Second, overt idealisms, if only by association with the dubious company of conscious or unconscious neo-Kantians or the theologically inclined. And third, non-dialectical materialisms, to take a handful of examples, what Badiou dubs democratic materialism, what I describe as capitalist biologism, Rose's neurogenetic determinism, and similar manifestations omnipresent nowadays. Four, despite carrying out this immunization, my position allows for outlining a contemporary materialism that is both fully compatible with the core of Marx and Engels shared Weltanschauung, as well as strikes a delicate balance between affirming freedom and, and admitting determinism. And this such that optimism as regards revolutionary subjective agency and realism as regards objective material conditions and constraints can be varyingly combined in manners appropriate and sensitive to shifting concrete conjunctures, thereby allowing for a tactically and strategically wise sober conviction that avoids deviating in either of the directions of wild-eyed Panglossianism or dull-eyed resignation. A main line of attack resorted to by Marxist hostile to Engels and his dialectics of nature is one sadly mirroring an all too familiar non-Marxist canard. This commonplace refrain mindlessly writes off Marxism in its multifaceted entirety by equating it wholesale with Stalinism. According to this popular and oft-repeated mantra, Stalin's USSR is the inevitable and logically consequent outcome of Marx's ideas with the reality of bureaucratic state terror purportedly revealing, with the benefit of 20th century historical hindsight, the unrealistic and disaster-prone 19th century utopianism of communism's champions. <coughs> Opponents of a dialectical materialism integrated with the natural sciences, this includes a number of Western Marxists, sometimes might be tempted to conjure up the ghost of Stalin's favored barefoot scientist, the Ukrainian agronomist Trofim Lysenko, Lysenko represents for Soviet science what Stalin represents for really existing socialism as a whole, namely a terrifying nosedive into rigid dogmatism, superficial polemics, cynical institutional maneuvering, and paranoia-driven purges. 
Just as the figure of Stalin serves anti-communists as ostensibly a reduction to the absurdly horrific of Marxism in its entirety, so too does Lysenko serve anti-Engelsians in rationalizing their rejection of every conceivable dialectical materialist philosophy of nature and science. No self-respecting Marxist accepts as valid and compelling the stale anti-Marxist argument using Stalinism to condemn Marxism über Haupt. Any Marxist who turns around and exploits Lysenkoism as the corresponding scientific subvariant of Stalinism to deploy the exact same type of argument against dialectical materialist appropriations of the natural sciences should be ashamed. Similarly, not only must today's radical leftists cease feeling pressured into interminable self-flagellation by all those to their right who demand they paralyze themselves into inaction by infinitely apologizing for the miseries of really existing socialism. <laughs> Marxist thinkers at the dawn of the 21st century ought to stop saying they're sorry for the tragedy of Lysenkoism. Before doing this, some contemporary Marxists first will have to learn and appreciate the historical truth that they have been standing in the shadows of this, their unconscious guilt, for quite a while already. At this moment, I cannot resist a passing invocation of Walter Benjamin's deservedly famous and celebrated essay, Theses on the Philosophy of History. With this reference in view, I would suggest that Engels' dialectical materialist engagement with the sciences and the carrying forward of this project, primarily by Soviet Marxists in the early 20th century, is, for the past 50 plus years of radical leftist political thinking in the West, a quote, image of the past that is not recognized by the present as one of its own concerns, end quote. Which, as Benny Mean goes on to warn, quote, threatens to disappear irretrievably, end quote. In his sixth and following thesis on the philosophy of history, he cautions, quote, even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins, and this enemy has not ceased to be victorious, end quote. Historical materialism a la Benjamin combats these dangers by, quote unquote, brushing history against the grain. Moreover, a Marxist historical materialist also is obligated to brush the history of Marxism itself against the grain, at least from time to time, and especially in situations of crisis. With these pertinent Benjaminian worries in mind, my rallying cry to return to Engels is motivated in part by the hunch and the hope, non-Hitlerian of course, the hunch and the hope that, uncover, uh, that uncovering the obscured grains of the past he and his sympathizers left for the future might equip fighting leftists in the here and now with powerful new arms in the war against a globalized late capitalism fundamentally reliant upon the natural sciences, both economically and ideologically. I strongly suspect that turning science into a Trojan horse, when already conveniently situated at the beating heart of biopolitical techno-scientific capitalism, this is a much more promising strategy for the left than sticking exclusively to cultural ideology critique and or hurling objections against the high walls of scientific fortresses from positions outside them. As every Hegelian knows, the only critiques really worth making are imminent ones. In resurrecting the scientifically minded Engels, I seek, as Benjamin varyingly puts it, quote, to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger, end quote, to take, quote, a tiger's leap into the past, end quote, to quote unquote blast out and bring back to light an overshadowed historical sequence previously entombed as a virtual specter in the historical past, but more pregnant than ever with future possibilities. In the early 21st century, imminently converting the sciences to dialectical materialism, internally raising them to the dignity of these, their notions, is an urgent imperative under the shadows of the simultaneously threatening and promising risks situated in such socially central spheres as ecology, genetics, health, and agriculture. The anti-clerical fighting spirit of 18th century French materialism must be revived, this time in the fight against a new church, that of capitalism's flashy, gadget-bejeweled techno-scientism, or in familiar French theoretical terms, a fight against Althusser's hegemonic educational ideological state apparatuses and or Lacan's now dominant university discourse. 
I believe this option not only to be advisable on the tactical and strategic grounds of hard-nosed political and propagandistic practice as indispensable to a Gramscian war of position, if not a war of maneuver. For me, this is a matter of recognizing that much of what is revealed by today's sciences, in an actuality whose obscurity renders it no less actual, ultimately testifies in favor of Marxian and Gelsian dialectical materialism. With the Marxist insight into the partisan, partisanship of truths in view, for the sciences as for all other disciplines, objectivity and neutrality are not synonymous. The radical left can and should have confidence that beneath both intra and non-scientific encrustations of ideologically distorted and distorting scientisms, the empirical and experimental sciences Rather than being incorrigibly complicit with prevailing status quo ideologies, the irrational rationalizing of fully administered worlds, and or the machinations of biopower, the sciences are ripe for joining in movements of history straining against the barriers and currents of the capitalist era, an era in which they've rapidly matured over the past two centuries nonetheless. Through reviving the Engelsian project of theorizing the sciences through the lenses of dialectical materialism, Capitalism can be shown to be irrational, not only in terms of its demand for alienating submission to the anarchy of markets, but also to be irrational in the strictest philosophical and scientific senses. In his 2010 book, Living in the End Times, Slavoj Žižek proclaims, quote, a resuscitation of the critique of political economy is the sine qua non of contemporary communist politics, end quote. As he rightly maintains, Most Marxists in the West of the past several decades have left the core of the mature Marxist thought by the wayside. Many of these theorists generally limit Marxism to functioning as a matrix solely for ideology critique at the level of the study of cultures. I would supplement Zizek's proclamation apropos the necessary condition for the current renewal of communism, that is, repeating a new Marxist historical materialist critique of political economy, I would supplement this with a declaration of my own already signaled above. The sine qua non of contemporary Marxist materialism is a revival of a dialectics of nature nurtured by cutting edge science and capable of combating the practical and ideological complicity of scientists and scientisms with a globalized late capitalism ever more reliant on them. That is, repeating anew Engel's dialectical materialist philosophy of the natural sciences. The criticisms of science used by Marxists in the West to rationalize leaving the dialectics of nature by the historical wayside are simultaneously too critical and not critical enough. On the side of being too critical, such Marxists with an all or nothing purist absolutism construe the embeddedness in capitalism of the empirical and experimental sciences of modernity as wholly and completely compromising these fields to the very core. On the side of being not critical enough, Such Western Marxists fail to take up the struggle against ideological scientisms on the battlefield of the sciences themselves, conceding too much ground to their opponents in advance. In this vein, Timpanaro justifiably warns, quote, unless it confirms and deepens materialism in the way that Engels sought to achieve in the Marxist field, Marxism becomes a philosophy confined to arts graduates or pure philosophers, end quote. In the origin of the family, private property, and the state, Engels, who considers the modern sciences to be crowning achievements of human civilization, declares as a dialectician that, quote, everything civilization brings forth is double-edged, double-tongued, divided against itself, contradictory, end quote. The radical left of the 21st century must seize and utilize ruthlessly the contradictions of contemporary science and its extra scientific entanglements remembering with confidence that these scientific swords, too, can slice in multiple directions. Lenin's marvelous 1922 article on the significance of militant materialism, with its expression of his trust in the spontaneous materialist leanings of science, argues for the importance of recruiting natural scientists to be radicalized public representatives of atheistic dialectical materialism. As regards this forcefully proposed program, He maintains that failing to recruit these types of intellectuals wouldn't be merely to miss an opportunity. It would be for communist militants a self-defeating abandonment of these knowledge workers 
to the fate of becoming agents of capitalism formidably endowed with potent intellectual firepower and sociocultural prestige. Capitalism's scientific laborers must be allowed and encouraged to enlist in the ranks of its other intellectual and manual grave diggers. The left has much to gain and even more to lose by ignoring or shunning such cross-disciplinary cooperation and solidarity. Timpanaro insightfully remarks that the, quote, daily experience of the degradation of science from an instrument of liberation to one of oppression gives rise to the one-sided and mistaken reduction of science to ideology, end quote. Leftists desperately need to learn to resist this understandable but nonetheless misleading anti-scientific impulse. The hour is overdue for awakening some of the mighty dead and for beginning again starting from Engels, that dear, invaluable comrade of Marx. Thank you. Um, I know Slavo is already ready. Um, are there other questions? Um, otherwise, I'm sure he'll warm up the audience. Go ahead. But you have to go to the, to the microphone. <laughs> First, I'm fundamentally, I agree with you. I just see some, you know, devilish in details and so on. First, you know, like when you say we must return dialectical material, you know that this concept, dialectical materialism, has a history which is far from unproblematic. First, uh, I love Lenin. I wrote a book praising him. But, you know, Lenin has his moments of literally lunacy, seeing visions. One is when he repeats endless, he repeats in materialism and empirical criticism that Marx and Engels thousands of times called their teaching dialectical materialism. They didn't do not even once. Uh, if I correct me, maybe you at the end know better. I think that the first one to coin the term was Josef Dietzgen. Well, actually, Dietzgen and Kautsky simultaneously in the same year coined I didn't that know. particular I, phrase. I know only that later, that's how it's taken. It was made part of orthodoxy by Georgi Plekhanov. Not my best friend, if I may put it in these terms. So much about, so you know, when you are saying, uh, return to this tradition of, you, uh, you make as if you are referring to some glorious past successful tradition of dialectical materialist appropriation of science. I don't see anything till now glorious in this tradition. Do you mind if I respond to each yeah, point in yeah, turn? Yeah. All right, so starting with this point, you know, of course, factually speaking, you're absolutely correct. It's Dietzgen and Kautsky who in the same year coined the phrase dialectical mm -hmm. materialism. However, I want to use... Uh, materialist dialectics once in English. Yeah, but yes. materialist dialectics, yes. not... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Incidentally, just so that I uh, compliment Etienne, also it's, as you probably know, it's interesting to know that never, never, in this famous manuscript, uh, Engels uses the term dialectics of nature. He only once refers to it conditionally as dialectic sozusagen in der Natur. Dialectics, as it were, so to say, in nature. But he does yeah. in, at length describe the idea of dialectical processes that are objectively existent in mind-independent nature uh, on sich. And aren't you course, now using, aren't you getting, to quote my good friend when he yeah. kicks me uh, in the ass, Bruno, aren't you now including too much collateral damage by using the term existing objectively, blah, blah, blah. This for me already smells of the late, you know, this are, so I'm sorry, please no, finish. No, no, but I'm I mean, sorry. of course, actually, you'll find it already in Hegel, in the manner in which Hegel talks about nature, and in a, in a manner which clearly signals that he is not an anti-realist, despite identifying himself as an absolute idealist. But I want to use one of your own examples here, where you know you point out how there, what can happen is is there can be a later invention, let's say in the history of art, uh, where a new medium arises, and that that new medium is actually able better to capture what was already be uh, there was already a struggle to express in a prior 
form, let's say, mm -hmm. for instance, certain novelistic techniques, which can actually only be fully realized with the subsequent technology of film as a medium uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of storytelling, for instance. And if you go back and you look at, uh, uh, you look at the phrases that are used that aren't dialectical materialism per se, but when you have Marx and Engels both talking about this new materialism that's different from all hitherto <coughs> existing materialisms up to and including mm -hmm. the 18th century French materialists, how this is non-contemplative, mm -hmm. etc. Basically what I would say is, is that there is no violence being done there interpretively, no anachronism in essentially reading back into that what then is named later by Dietzkin and Kautsky. So I think that uh, I could make a very strong case based on reading of those okay. texts. Okay. That, but, know, okay, let me go to my crucial point. First, where I agree with you, maybe you all don't agree, is that what we should get rid of with all my appreciation of Heidegger as a thinker is this idea of, I simplify to the utmost, but that's how in popular knowledge it works, automatic, you know, if not, they of course don't use the term ideology, but this is science identified with technological exploitation, manipulation of nature, so science is meaningful only within the modern exploitation of nature and so on and so on. Yeah. I think we should definitely free science from this and also I hope you agree here, Alain is right, uh, you know in our historicist discourse analysis relativism, we like to, as Alain pointed out, replace science with knowledge, fields of knowledge. We have science, we have superstition, we have mystical knowledge, and then the conclusion is, isn't it metaphysical, imperialist, phallogocentric, Eurocentrism to privilege our science? Like, who is to say that our sciences are privileged? Do we have any right to privilege sciences with regard to some kind of superstition, aren't they all different most of discourse which each of them creates its own objectivity? Here we agree. My problems, very briefly. First, you should have been a little bit more evil towards Engels. His weakest point in the text that you quoted, I dare you challenge you if you have it there to read it, is precisely, you passed so gently over language, no? There, I'm sorry to tell you, it's for me, Engels at its most stupid. I challenge you to read it because basically Engels says with the development of work, people, workers, no? Work got so complex that people started to feel the need to coordinate it, to tell each other about things. So they invented language, basically, no? I prefer Daniel Defoe to this theory, which is, you know, that first people were talking with small objects. I wanted to say house, so I showed to you a small model from my back of a house. Then, because of development, this burden that you had to carry grew larger and larger. And then one of them said, my God, why don't we replace objects with words, you know? Like, <laughs> Engels is too close to this for me there. Well, Second me. point, just I will be brief so that you can, so that I can sit down and stop talking. That's the only way. Bruno, I hope you agree here. Second point, precisely when you mentioned negation of negation. Although Engels mentioned it, I claim that all dialectical materialists that I know, even if we include Engels in it, Engels, Lenin, and so on, if you read them closely, their understanding of dialectics stops at Wechselwirkung, interaction. Not only A has influence on B, but B has influence back on the A, so they all interact, and so on, and so on. For uh, proper negation of negation. You need self-relating of determination. A doesn't only determine B, and it's not enough to say then B determined its back and they, if you allow me this plastic expression, this is disgusting to me, but I have to go to this level so that you will be able to understand me, he -he. It's not just that they screw each other then indefinitely, it's that A determines the very way it is determined by B. I claim you don't find this in them. Then uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the last point, you know what's the real problem here? Cut the crap even of Darwinism and so on. There is one mega revolution, theory of relativity, 
quantum physics. And when Lenin says, here I agree with him, with every great new scientific invention, the whole of materialism has to be redefined. Now, I don't, didn't yet, uh, this is where you should worry, and I do. Because then this opens field to all this bullshit, but isn't the point of uh, quantum physics, the revenge of spiritualism, ooh, our mind creates reality, and so on. This is, for me, the question today. Not by relativizing it, quant not by saying, oh, but it's still basically the old uh, materialism, the standard way. It's not. It's something new. How to read it in a materialist way without watering it down somehow into the old materialism. Would you agree with this, that this is maybe, maybe even more than Darwinism, the philosophical focus of the struggle? Um, I will take each of the points in turn, and I want to start with uh, the question of Badiou and how I would position myself in a little more detail vis-a-vis -vis, uh, him. Uh, what I'm calling... Okay. To cut a long story short, uh, I am deeply sympathetic to and am working along lines similar to what Badiou talks about under the heading of his uh, uh, materialist dialectic in Logics of Worlds. But for me, there's something symptomatic in the shift from materialism being a noun to becoming an adjective. And I think that Badiou, for a number of reasons, including his uh, understanding of science as lopsidedly determined by Coy Ray's Gal Galileo-centric reading of the emergence of the modern sciences that cuts Francis Bacon out of the story so that you don't have empirical experimental aspects incorporated into the understanding of it and it just becomes mathematical formalism. Um, his you know, hostility to biology and tendency, like Heidegger, to just lump it together with a whole set of other phenomena uh, and to view it as entirely compromised and suspect. Um, that for me, uh, what I think would be a, a better model would be basically his materialist dialectics, but able to and uh, you know, very much uh, you know, grounded in an incorporation of a lot of the life scientific material that I think actually speaks very strongly in favor of this against you know, competing paradigms that he might subsume under the rubric of democratic materialism. Then on your points regarding Engels, first uh, 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 the issue of his account of language. I agree with you. I think that uh, it's stupid. Uh, and there's a lot, uh, especially at the more empirical level in his work, which of course is the risk you always take with dealing with empirical material. It hasn't aged well. Uh, uh, in the same fashion, too, that if you go back to Hegel's philosophy of nature, um, there are a number of things in there that are terribly embarrassing, even for the most hard-nosed, committed Hegelians who aren't willing, like Pippin, to just ditch the philosophy of nature as an embarrassing, brief episode in Hegel's intellectual itinerary. Um, so I have no problem with reworking uh, the account of language uh, in a way that doesn't at all depend on the letter of Engel's text whatsoever. Um, so that's fine with me. Um, also, I agree with you, too, about uh, his oversimplification of negation of negation. Um, and in fact, as you might recall, I try and use even Levins and the Wanton, who aren't, uh, you know, they're, they're very good theoretically, but, you know, at the same time, they don't go into the nitty gritty details of Hegelian dialectics to work it out. They're still a step forward over Engels in this regard. I mean, in a way, uh, you might say that there's very little of the letter of Engels that I'm interested in repeating, but the basic gesture of carrying out this project, that is what is crucial to repeat, just in the same way that when you talk about repeating Lenin, um, it's a repetition with a lot of difference, and that is the same thing that I would say apropos my relationship to Engels, my invocation of him. Um, as far as uh, the issue of uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory and the life sciences versus physics, um, this is part, of course, of a debate we have going on that I actually have an in an another installment prepared for you. Um, basically, what I see, uh, to, to cut a long story short, I don't see this as, mutual, uh, as a mutually exclusive uh, confrontation. I think that materialism uh, and a materialism engaged with the sciences has to be looking both at what has gone on in physics, including now that we're dealing with the possibility of neutrinos that exceed the speed of light and... Oh, oh, the, the certain results got, okay. I'm sorry to disappoint you because it would be too nice. You know, that idea that they localize in certain <coughs> particles which violate the basic axiom of Einstein that nothing can move faster than speed of light, it was a calculating mistake, unfortunately. <laughs> ah, oh well. 
<laughs> but for me at the same time, I, I think that at the risk of coming up with a version of nature as a big other, as a one-all, uh, that the idea that all of it would ultimately have to be cashed out at the level of quantum physics, well, the most hard-nosed reductionists are the ones who ultimately have to be committed to the idea that uh, at the smallest level, that the physics of whatever the rock bottom smallest level is, is the ultimate court of adjudication for all questions uh, of a materialist sort. And that plays right into the hands of the most anti-dialectical of the, of the scientists. So I think that you have to at least affirm, to use a, a problematic turn of phrase, the relative autonomy of the biological vis-a-vis -vis the physical, um, while at the same time looking at what's going on in all the different levels and layers of science if you're going to you know, go all the way with this kind of program that I'm pleading for here. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, what, to bring out one, maybe one implication or uh, one thing, I was wondering, what does it mean to imminently convert the scientists or science to dialectical materialism? Because uh, shortly before you ended, you rephrased that in terms of educate the scientists. And my simple, I mean, you were mentioning Malabu. And Malabu, if I get her right, her, what shall we do with our brains, her idea is via the intervention of philosophy, scientific uh, <clears throat> propositions can be used in a way that is similar to ideology critique. We're living under the imperative of to be flexible and as, uh, I don't know, brain science shows us that our brains are plastic, we can, and we are also form giving, not only are taken forms, therefore the interventional philosophy can use that concept against the imper uh, imperative to be flexible and use it as a means of ideology critique. So how does it now work the other way around? Um, or what, how, how would you explain the moment, how to educate? I'm supposed to be a Stalinist here, but yeah. you are now entering, <laughs> yeah. stealing the field from me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so there'll be retreats, is what we'll call them. Uh, you know, like the faculty retreats, we have to take he at the start of each academic. He didn't say re-educate, he said educate, not re-educate. so. Or do you think that they are idiots who have to be? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is now as far as uh, Kathleen's work goes. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is, is that you're absolutely right. In what should we do with our brain? That uh, 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 focus on the ideological dimension is very much to the fore, and it's a lovely aspect of that book, which is, I think, a great piece of work on a number of levels. Um, but one thing that uh, I've noticed is in her subsequent work, there's been less attention paid to these issues of uh, uh, rigidity and flexibility to one-sided readings of, of this double-sided notion of plasticity that she first extracts from Hegel in her dissertation, um, that that has been less of an issue for her, and she's been more interested in how especially continental philosophers of the past century have to change their ways of thinking when confronted with just the brute facts of, in, in particular, neurobiology. That, um, for instance, uh, and not only neurobiology, but uh, she's now very engaged with epigenetics and with using epigenetics to problematize, for example, the kind of biopolitical discourse first developed by the late Foucault and then, of course, uh, uh, kept on the contemporary agenda quite forcefully by Agamben, um, and to point out that um, either the, the Zoe Bios distinction that Agamben relies upon um, is much more complicated and fluid than he uh, you know, admits, or it's invalidated even by uh, the challenge to traditional ways of thinking about life according to the biologists and the non-biologists by something like epigenetics. Um, and so she's already, I think, uh, also trying to push in this opposite direction in the way that I am too. I mean, of course, there would be implications. Um, you know, uh, Slavoj mentioned Heidegger. I could, you know, t I mentioned the Frankfurt School, Dorno and Company, um, the Althusserians and their conception of science. Um, first, you would have to have amongst the non-scientists a shift in terms of the philosophical machinery that's being interfaced with uh, the sciences. But it's not a one-way street. And even though I used that uh, you know, perhaps vaguely Stalinist language of, you know, educating them, um, that, uh, <laughs> pardon? Yeah, converting them, even flirting with a little bit of the religious language since the Benjamin references were there in the context, um, that it's a matter of uh, us meeting each other halfway. And I do think that it's a kind of conversion where it's a matter of showing them how they're already in certain ways struggling 
to express certain relations or uh, 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 complex uh, structures and dynamics that if without the language of uh, the tradition of you know, the Marxist materialism as permutations and offshoots, that they're actually having, and of course Hegelian dialectics first and foremost, they're having an enormous amount of trouble really doing justice to this, yet at the same time they're already on their own spontaneously straining to a certain point in this direction. Now we have to also bear in mind that we're not just talking about scientists as always being scientists, or that whatever they say about their discipline is scientific, right? That mixed in with their talk about their own discipline, and especially with the ones who try and reach a wider public. Um, for instance, with neuroscience, take Kathleen's favorite writer, Antonio Damasio, right? There's a lot of uh, uh, more than scientific speculation that is being interfaced with the quote unquote scientific material he's dealing with. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there's a need to develop or to help cultivate in those who are are doing this sort of work on the scientific side, um, since they can't avoid but you know, philosophize about what they're doing, that no you know, quote unquote physics is without its metaphysics, um, that assisting them in that by providing them with resources we have. Because if you talk to a lot of people in cognitive science uh, or the neurosciences, most of what they have available to them from philosophy comes from the Anglo-American tradition, which continental philosophers have ceded to them um, basically a, a, a jurisdiction or it's their turf, the sciences, mathematics, logic, that's all for them. I mean, Badiou, of course, wonderfully contests this on the formal side. Um, but but the problem is, is that the standard history of philosophy education, which up until recently, somebody trained in the, the uh, dominant in the American Academy, analytic orientation, their history of philosophy stops at P.F. Strawson's Kant uh, and doesn't pick up again until Frege, Russell, and Wittgenstein and company early in the 20th century. Of course, what's left out of that is Hegel, who only, you know, who still is marginalized, although now has been somewhat vindicated by the interests of the uh, Pittsburgh neo-Hegelian students of Sellers, Brandon and McDowell, right? But dialectics, materialism, all of that in the forms that we are talking about here is a big gap in the standard analytic philosophical education. And so if this is the philosophy which the scientists have to try and think through it in a more theoretically rigorous fashion what they're doing, they're not being equipped with what would allow them to reach perhaps some of these more interesting conclusions that would also have uh, some uh, uh, potential fascinating political upshots. Um, but that's just a rough sketch of an answer to that. But um, at the same time, I'm not going to fully back away from the slight Stalinist tone. I mean, I do think that we have to have the confidence to believe that we're right sometimes and to be willing to be um, a little heavy handed uh, to make our point. And especially since this is urgent, policy is being made about this with the, uh, in consultation with the scientists such a rapid pace, I think we probably don't have enough time to do what I'm talking about. But in desperation, you know, the, you know, the long, drawn-out, Socratic dialogue style of conversion, uh, you know, might not necessarily be, uh, you know, the most efficient way to go about it. But I want to leave time for Let, other let's questions. Let's give at least a, a little try, you know, the, the Socratic dialogue. <laughs> There's one, one other person waiting for that. Um, well, this won't take long because you don't have to take it as seriously. But I, there was one phrase that you used that jumped out at me, yeah. which was, a virtual specter, and I was just trying to figure out what a virtual specter would be because it's you know maybe really really spectral. But anyway, as 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 I was as I was uh, pondering that, you uh, you very encouragingly told us that we don't have to be uh, ashamed of the Stalinism anymore, and therefore well, not quite so. I, I'm simplifying as well, yeah. but not quite so afraid of the Lysenkoism as well. And so what I was thinking of, of course, if, if even if there was no original sin, perhaps we we should be a little bit more scared. Maybe that specter is uh, a little bit more. Uh, tangible than we thought. You know, I guess basically you were saying, okay, we, could, we should trust the scientists, but as long as they don't have too much unsupervised play, and so we should maybe you know, educate them a bit, as you were saying. So it kind of follows from what you were saying. So, Well, actually, this, uh, I can answer this by connecting back up with a point that Slavoj made that I didn't get around to touching upon. Um, and as you pointed out, this is not some glorious tradition that you know, marched triumphantly uh, for a long time and then, you know, for some reason, degenerated, fell apart, you know, became defunct, etc. Um, and bear in mind that the reference to Benjamin uh, does a, a, a number of things for me. There are several levels on which it's working. And one of them is, is that, you know, of course, what, uh, what some of the examples Benjamin has 
has in mind are things like you know, the 1871 Paris Commune, which was uh, excruciatingly brief and you know, judged by the standards of longevity, was a blip and a failure from that standpoint. Um, but the idea is, is that, all right, what we need to go back and resurrect, right, the dead who we need to save uh, from those who we're struggling with uh, are not, you know, the, I talked about the mighty dead, but the mighty dead not in the sense of these were the giants who straddled the stage of history and, you know, were really uh, uh, dominant for a long time, but rather those who had so much promise and potential, but that it never managed to fully develop in the past, right? So it's a kind of a, a, an alternate history in a way that we can retroactively discern. And then the question is, what would uh, a kind of vindication at this point in time after the fact look like, right? And so this imagery of these ghosts who are entombed and exist in this virtual state precisely because they're not even part of the actual official history. I mean, even in Western Marxism, the degree of ignorance about um, what Engels was doing apropos the sciences uh, and then how this was developed. I mean, for instance, a really seminal event that radicalized a lot of British Marxist scientists in the 1930s was a conference that happened in London in 1931 on the history of science and technology. It was the second annual meeting of this conference, and it was uh, in its first meeting just a kind of gathering of hobbyists who had you know this sort of antiquarian interest in the history of science and technology. But at the second meeting, uh, a Soviet delegation led by Bukharin uh, crashed the conference. They arrived there unannounced uh, and gave a series of papers which just galvanized uh, a lot, especially uh, 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 scientists and philosophers in, in Britain at the time. Um, and that there's, uh, you know, the, the proceedings of this, which um, when, it, when this happened, it, the Soviet embassy in London was turned into basically a publishing house for five days. And there was feverish work on translating the text from the Russian into English, and then they published it at the end of five days. Um, it's a volume entitled Science at the Crossroads. Um, and you only see it referenced in specialist intellectual histories of the Marxist philosophy of science, such as a wonderful book by uh, Helena Sheehan, uh, Marxism and the Philosophy of Science, A Critical History of the First Hundred Years. Um, um, and when I wanted to get a hold of this, there was only one copy that could be found uh, anywhere in the Western world by uh, my interlibrary loan service at the British Museum that was then sent over. Um, printed. Pardon? It's been reprinted. It's been reprinted. Well, because it's funny. This was, and I even got the 1971 edition. It was uh, published by Frank Cass and Company, uh, and they hunted everywhere. I tried to find it online, could not. Um, anyhow, and this is, I mean, when you go back and you look at this, you see that there was this thwarted, I think, potential or possibility, which then for a number of reasons in terms of both developments in, in the subsequent history of Marxism in the West, I mean, Engel, I'm mean, sorry, Lukács is really the first to, to rubbish, uh, uh, you know, uh, Engels in this way in a footnote to his 1919 essay, What is Orthodox Marxism? That opens history and class consciousness is its first chapter. Um, and that this end up, ends up getting forgotten even within Marxism, let alone, of course, any sense of what you know this involved in the wider intellectual world. And so this is really what I'm getting at in terms of using this kind of vaguely Benjaminian language uh, uh, you know, in the context of direct references to him about this. So no original sin, but no lost paradise either. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. On that note, um, we're going to take a, a brief break until 4.30, and then we'll um, gather again. Um, now, thank you. Okay. Um, Etienne Balibar, um, that's